Okay, guys, welcome to the Proverbs 31 Ministries podcast, where we share biblical truth for any girl in any season. I'm your host, Kaylee Olson. I'm here with my co-host, Maddie Vincent. I love being here. I love that you're back. here. But can I also say, soon to be Maddie Greenfield. You guys, the count She's getting married. on. It's I'm getting married in like three weeks. Yeah, it's like we're living in the already, wow. but not yet of your marriage, because when yeah. we're recording this, you're not. But when we release it, you will be. So. Oh, wow. I didn't know I that. Know. I didn't no. know that either. That's why. I know. So it's should great. we say Greenfield now? I don't know. We'll figure it out. This is going to be We'll figure wild. it out. But wild. we're also here with Joel, Dr. Joel Minamale, our resident theologian here. And I'm excited to be on the show with you guys today. But Maddie, I would love for you to introduce our topic for today. Yes. Okay. So the other day we were at the office talking mm-hmm. and a lot of the more interesting things that we make content about usually stem from really great conversations that we have just as a staff here at the office. And um, we were discussing kind of this view of God as a vending machine. Like if I do X, Y, Z, I will receive what I want. And so um, just kind of this idea of what do I have to do to get God to give me what I want or that kind of feeling of regret if I had only done something differently god would have given me or done something differently in my life Mm -hmm. um and as we were kind of talking about this i realized there is a term called retributional theology wow that's a did i say that correctly (laughs) okay scholar maddie thank you this is why joel's and i had a lot of questions about it (laughs) yeah so here we are with um kaylee and joel And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this mindset of God being a vending machine and the way we act really determining what we get from God. Yeah. 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 I think that's great. Um, So I I, I think the first thing everybody's probably wondering, Mm -hmm. retributional theology? Yeah. Can you please explain this term to me? Yeah. I am a fourth grader. Yeah. Like I'm a five-year-old. I actually want to, I want to take a little (laughs) step back. Like you're a what? Five-year-old. Five-year-old. Mm-hmm. What's then? You said what? I said fourth grader. Fourth grader. That's, I need it dumbed yeah. down a it's, little bit more. Okay. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's also a pretty wide gap between a fourth. We'll let you know if we have more questions okay, after good. you explain. Um, but I would say I would say this that uh, retributional. Let's take a step back from retributional theology, and and oftentimes what happens is we say a word like this, and we get disconnected or we get turned off because we're like, mm-hmm. wow, here's some massive theological concept that is so unrelatable and out of touch for all of us as, as human beings. But what I want us to actually see is that this concept is actually something that is incredibly appealing to all of us. Yeah. And, and here's why. Here's why. It makes sense. Let me just start this way. It makes sense for a person to do something really, really good and then for that person to receive a reward for that good thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Because C.S. Lewis referred to it this way as, as humanity having a moral compass built into the human heart. Mm-hmm. So in a way, God has created us innately uh, to know what is right and what is wrong. Mm-hmm. And part of that is like, hey, if you do like really, really good things, then of course, good things should then follow your actions. And if you're wicked, and you do really bad things and um, you're conniving and manipulative and deceitful. Mm-hmm. Um, it really makes sense that bad things should then, you know, follow the course of your bad actions. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like my kids at home um, when they do their dishes and when they like clean the house and they do all these things, they're looking at, uh, at us for like, hey, can we have dessert tonight? And I'm like, why do you think just because you did what you should normally do right. as a productive human being in our household that you right. should get like ice cream tonight, you know? Yeah. But embedded into their hearts is like, well, no, I did something good. You know, mm-hmm. like we were responsible. And so we should be rewarded for that. So take that just like basic impulse of the human heart. And now let's talk about retributional theology. This is one of those things that's so fascinating that there's really nothing new underneath the sun Mm -hmm. and that this is part of the miracle of scripture, that scripture is relatable across centuries. And so in the ancient Near Eastern world, when we say ancient Near Eastern, we're talking about the Old Testament um, in the land geographical area of of Mesopotamia um, and kind of that that region, Egypt, you know, the, um, the Crescent, all that. Okay. They had this concept called retributional theology, which basically meant that the way that God related to humanity was based off of their moral behavior. Mm. And so if you were an individual that was morally upright, morally good, well, then God 
or in the polytheistic world, the gods would then give to you something positive. And if you did something super negative and, and evil and you were conniving and you woke up one day and, you know, you had cancer or you woke up one day and uh, you look out into your fields and, and a, a storm came and destroyed all of your, your uh, fields, like mm -hmm. that is evidence of, hey, you kind of got what was co what was coming to you. And so retributional theology um, is really this concept, like if I could just super simplify it, it's um, good things happen to good good people, bad things happen to bad bad people mm -hmm. and if you're a good person and bad things happen to you then you better check yourself because you probably did something bad you know and until you figure out that bad and how to correct that bad mm -hmm. god is going to continue to do bad things to you or allow bad things to take to take place yeah yeah but it falls apart a little bit when good bad things happen to good people yeah and then it falls apart again when good things happen to people where you see their actions, you're like, wait, what? Yeah, Why are they, they getting this huge mm -hmm. blessing when I see how they're acting in other mm -hmm. places? Yeah. 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 So in our life, though, I feel like what we did was just normalize the term retributional theology, even though I would never go around and say that this is the view of theology that I have. I don't even really know how you would say that in a sentence, retributional theology as, as an action word. But what I really want to know from you, Joel, is how does this play out in my life? Like, how might I be able to identify that this is a mindset that I have taken on as a view of God? Yeah. Like, what are some actions that I might be doing consistently? So I want to, again, like, I'm just so sensitive to the fact that this isn't, um, like, the, like what comes next isn't mm -hmm. supposed to be condemning in yeah. any way, right? Uh, in fact, our, our mutual friend, Jim Kress, mm -hmm. when we talk about narcissism and we talk about um, NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, Jim is so brilliant because he always points out that it is clinically proven mm -hmm. that every human has some narcissistic mm -hmm. tendencies built into them. Sure. You know, yeah. so there's a vast difference between having a narcissistic tendency mm -hmm. versus having narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So totally different. So yeah. again, I'm going to kind of take the same principle and apply it here that there may be things mm -hmm. that that we kind of naturally do because in a fallen world, it kind of just makes sense for us mm -hmm. to want to do it. Um, and the good news is that scripture gives us a little bit of, of course correct. So yeah. here, here are a couple of things, and I'm going to give it another term. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Ooh, that's a big one, right? Wow. Moralistic, that's kind of like our morals. Okay. Um, ther therapeutic, that uh, Greek word therapeo means to heal or to cure, mm -hmm. okay. right? So moral curing, deism deals with mm -hmm. the deity to, to God. So it's that God would bring healing or curing to humanity through our moralism, through our morality, okay? So with that in mind, um, we might think that if I just stop, like you might have a problem with cussing, like you're a cusser, mm -hmm. you know? You got filthy words that come out your mouth. <laughs> Which one of us are you making eye contact with? I neither. If you notice, I looked at yeah. both of you, and then I thought I might look at those right there. I don't know what those things are, but I'm gonna look at them because they're inanimate objects, and I can't get in trouble. So, um, yeah, like let's just say hypothetically, there's a person, and they're your friend, and they'd be cussing, just lots of cussing, okay. and they and and things are going wrong <laughs> consistently, mm -hmm. and they wake up in the middle, and they're like, you know what? Like I shouldn't be cussing. Like I feel convicted. Okay. And so they they start praying, like Lord, help me not to cuss. I don't want, I want only wholesome things to come out of my mouth, whatever it might be. Okay, great. A couple of days go by, things are still whack and wild in their life. <laughs> like it, it did not, it did not get better, okay. you know, not, okay. but notice the pattern that we had. We had, oh, we identified something that we were doing that was sinful yeah. in our life. We thought maybe if I pray, confess, and then ask God to help me not do that thing anymore, mm -hmm. that that thing would then go away. So you go through the action of it and then you find out, oh, it didn't go away, you know? So then how does it go? Here's another one. Um, and, and and often what happens actually is we take spiritual, this is kind of, um, it's going to feel aggressive, but just follow okay. me. We take spiritual disciplines and we weaponize them for moralistic gains. Okay. Okay. Something like fasting. Okay. Huh. Like I can maybe spiritually manipulate God in order to gain me whatever it is that I want. Maybe it's a big promotion that you're looking to get. And you're like, oh, I really want to do all the right things in order to make sure that God shows favor upon me. So I'm going to do a Daniel fast or a juice fast or whatever fast it might be, you know. And so it's a type of manipulation that you're taking a spiritual discipline that's super important, like fasting, prayer, um, reading God's word. All these things are, are very important. 
But if we try to weaponize them Mm -hmm. in order to spiritually manipulate God to cause good to happen to us, it's evidence of a mindset that is falling into this ancient kind of concept of, hmm, bad things happen to bad people, good things happen to good people. So if you're a good person and bad things are happening to you, figure out how you can spiritually manipulate God Mm -hmm. in order to forgive the bad thing that you did in order for good things to happen. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Um, But I feel like what's confusing about this to me, Joel, is I feel like it's easy for Christians to fall into this retribution theology or uh, moralistic, what is the word? De- moralistic therapeutic deism. What you just said. Yep. Because when we look at the book of Proverbs, uh, I read a verse the other morning in my read through the Bible plan. And it said, Proverbs 14, 14 says, the disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves and a good one what his deeds deserve. Mm, mm. And it's so interesting to look at a book like Proverbs and think this is God's word. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Mm-hmm. But then there's also uh, what you just talked about, the idea that we can't manipulate God. And so yeah. we take things in our, our own yeah. hands. And so let's let's go there. Yeah. When when does when when do we take this too far? And yeah. What does that look like? Like you just talked about manipulating spiritual disciplines. So mm-hmm. let's go there a little bit further. Um, this is a big one. Uh when I teach a uh, hermeneutics class, hermeneutics is just the um, the the word that's used to describe our method of studying the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, so let's just do a, a quick exercise for you. Um, let's say that um, there's a favorite book. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to stick with Tolkien because I'm a Tolkien nerd. So let's say Lord of the Rings. Okay. And I handed you Lord of the Rings. You know, Mads, I handed you Lord of the Rings, and I said, "Hey, I'm really excited. I want you to read this book. This book is um, historical biography. I gave you the category." It's historical biography. And you open it up and all of a sudden there are elves, there are dwarfs, there so is Saruman, <laughs> there is a wild ring that right. is in control of all these, like, right? There are halflings, like what this hobbit situation, like, and you're like, historical biography. Mm-hmm. How do I read this? Yeah. Right? So what's happened is you've taken uh, words that were intended to be understood in one way mm-hmm. And you impose a totally different way of understanding it. And when that happens, it's chaotic. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's go to the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. When somebody hands you or you open up Proverbs and, you know, I've got a friend right now that's reading a proverb a day. Mm -hmm. um, Are we supposed to read Proverbs as if they are literal um, A plus B equals C? Mm -hmm. Or are we supposed to read them as proverbial that they, they have policies of of generally right behavior with generally the consequences that come with right behavior gener- yeah. generally evil behavior and generally the consequences that come with with evil behavior well i would say the second category but often what we do is we read proverbs and we want to impose a literal category and again i'm just like saying this makes sense to a human mind that just wants a plus b to always equal c yeah and the second a plus b does not equal c our world goes upside down. We feel unstable. We feel like everything is 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 out of whack, and we do everything we can to try to make sense of it. And mm-hmm. so this is this is what's happening with Proverbs. So Proverbs is telling us the image is like imagine like sitting down with your grandparents, you know, and they always have these like wise things that they say. Like my grandparents, when I was in India just uh, early, late last year, I sat down with my grandfather, and he would just be like saying these wise sayings, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm like writing them down as much as I can. Now, am I supposed to believe that? everything that he says is literal fact that if I do this thing that's and I'm like no we just know that in general that there's this wisdom of living your life in this type of way and typically you know good things may happen as a result of it and if bad things happen I don't go to my my grandfather and be like you liar <laughs> you know I'm not like, like you were horrible like I can't believe you did that you go oh no like there are consequences in a fallen world where these situations sometimes don't come true. Mm -hmm. So in the book of Proverbs, and if you're looking at different um, scriptures in the Bible and you're like, wait a minute, um, but the Bible says this, you know, it says that um, if I um, pray or if I, what was that verse that you, that you just read? Proverbs 14, 14. Yeah. The disloyal one would get what his Yeah, loyalty. And a good one was. Yeah, loyalty. This is a big one. Loyalty, the disloyal. So this is honor, shame society. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you are loyal, the other uh, in Hebrew, I'll translate into into Greek. Um, the Greek word um, is uh, pistis is faith. It can also be allegiance. Mm-hmm. If your allegiance is proper, 
the proper thing is going to happen. But if you're um, if you're not a legion, if you're disloyal, well, what's the consequence of disloyalty? You know, so you've got this principle that's kind of driving this. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying is there are natural consequences to how we live our life. But we don't have the power or control to manipulate God in a way right. that will always get what we want based on our actions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and just imagine, just run that logic if you could manipulate God. Is God still God? Mm-hmm. Right? Or is God just a supernatural being that can be manipulated and used at the whim of human hands? Mm-hmm. And now we go into the world of sorcery and witchcraft and, you know, all kinds of like malevolent kind of dark things. Mm -hmm. And and all throughout scripture, Deuteronomy 419, Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. I mean, you go all throughout the Shema and Exodus. You got all these passages of scripture where God's like, don't act. Leviticus, I think it's like 19, you know, like, like don't participate in those things. Why? Because those things lead you down a road where you actually are conned into believing that you can actually manipulate the supernatural world, that you can mm-hmm. manipulate God, and you can't. God is sovereign. So the big phrase here is that God is the created, and you and I are the creator. Mm-hmm. And we have to remember that creator-creation distinction. Otherwise, it's going to cause havoc uh, in our lives. And we have to go back to Genesis 3. When sin enters into the world, um, there's a theologian, Alvin Plantinga, who refers to it as despoiling shalom, that there are thousands of strands that connect humanity and creation and all of us together. And when sin enters it in, those thousands of strands are ruptured. Mm. And and when those things are ruptured, it creates um, instability in creation. So what is Jesus doing? He's actually reconnecting all those strands together. And Jesus does it on his own terms, right? Like mm-hmm. he doesn't, he takes for sure humanity into consideration. But when he thinks about what's best for humanity, he's thinking about what's best through the lens of perfection, not through the momentary um, perspective that you and I have, mm-hmm. uh, which is incredibly limited compared to his limitless vision of etern- eternity, past, present, and future. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But isn't that the lens that we as humans have, though? It's so, the moment is always so focused on us. Mm hmm. And I think it's so easy to slip into uh, like a me mindset instead of thinking about God and the bigger picture that he is working all things for our good. But whenever we think about ourselves, I don't think that I wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to focus on my self uh, preservation today or I'm going to focus on my success today. I'm going to make this about me. Right. I think it sneaks up uh through maybe some things that we read or things that we're exposed to and the theology is kind of flipped to well what can i control like for example um i have to earn my good standing with god like Mm -hmm. it's it's all up to me Mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about maybe like how does that play out in our life what's wrong about that what are some other things that we might be doing or that i might be doing on a daily basis that's sneaking up and i don't realize that the focus is being put back on me and what I control. And it's, yeah. It's, that, well, that question, know. the question itself is super important. Like mm-hmm. the way that you posed it, like, can you like, let's legitimately, honestly answer that question. Is there anything that you and I can do to earn good standing in front of a righteous God? No. Like, I know that. Right. But a lot of times I don't live it. Right. Because I'm a type A personality. Right. I am mm-hmm. equation based kind of person. I feel like if I do this, surely God will this. Yeah. So like, all you have to do is read Exodus through Malachi, right? Like from the delivering of the Ten Commandments of the law to the 200 years of silence. They call it 200 years of silence. There's actually a lot of writing that's happening in the intertestamental period, but I'm not going to get nerdy with you about all that. But the, like 200 years of silence, like what's actually happening? Well, Israel has tried the, to the best of their ability to live out the law to perfection, and they were unable. Yeah. The sacrifices kept coming the foreign empires kept destroying them. Like they were desperately in need of a savior. They were in need of the Messiah, the anointed one. Well, who's the Messiah? It's Jesus. And so it's, again, it's, I think what we have to do really from a practical standpoint is, is do a theology of remembrance. Um, We have to recall the reality of Jesus's death, burial, resurrection. And I always include ascension. It's these four parts Um, because it's, it's that, those truths that Jesus did die for us, 
that um, he did, he was buried, like it was a legitimate death, that he did conquer death through death, and he rose again, and then he was seated at the right hand of the Father, the, the ascension that makes it possible for you and I to have right standing uh, with God. So notice the proposition here. It's it's not first about me. So I want to be careful. I'm not saying this is self-dejection. All I'm saying is it doesn't start with me. It, and actually, this is incredibly more valuable. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if it starts with Jesus, then everything that is true about Jesus is then true about me. And if everything that's true about Jesus is true about me, y'all, that is so much more helpful. That is so much more beautiful. That is so much more powerful, right? Than just me trying to earn something on my own on my own means. Mm -hmm. And so we have to just consistently recall this theology of remembrance. I always wonder of the very th of the only, of the thing that Jesus gives to his disciples and to us today of um of like what we ought to remember him by. He chooses the crucifixion. Hmm. Like if I'm Jesus, I'm like, listen, I'm gonna pick the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. Maybe when I walk on the water, <laughs> you know, like even the ascension, like, hey, pay attention to me right now as I go into the heavens. Like that's what I want you. And Jesus refuses. He says, no, I want you to remember the the bread that's broken as in remembrance of my body, the, uh, the wine that you drink, the, the cup in remembrance of my blood that was spilled. This is a recollection of the crucifixion. Why? I think it's to embed a deep sense of humility in the hearts of humanity. Oh. It's so that you and I can consistently be reminded, first and foremost, of who God is, mm -hmm. what he's done for you and I, so that we can know how we relate to God, that we are children of God that he loves. And if we know who God is and we know who we are in light of who God is, we can know how we ought to rightly relate to humanity. Wow. Wow. I, I'm thinking about the people listening to mm -hmm. this and I'm thinking about, you know, someone who's carrying the weight of mm -hmm. their past sins or their past choices. Mm -hmm. And they're carrying the weight that they have to write those things to be in right standing with God. Yeah. And how this phrase of retributional theology and having a better understanding of who God is and having a right view of who God is takes that weight away. Yeah. And this isn't just, you know, a theological term that has nothing to do with how we live our day to day life. Mm -hmm. But this is actually like a really freeing perspective that for the person listening to this and they're carrying that weight. I want to encourage you, like we look to Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you don't have to carry it anymore. We yeah. can look to Jesus mm -hmm. and that is maybe the best thing that you could hear today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that, that, um, and you brought it up Maddie really well, that there are consequences to our sins. Yeah. There are natural things that we have to deal with there mm -hmm. right now. There's a really famous um, basketball player that's dealing with some consequences of his actions on social media and you know, all this stuff. Um, the reality of Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension is still true for him. Mm -hmm. It's still true for you. Yeah. If you're carrying like, man, I did this thing and, it's it's a weight that's on my heart and I'm not, you know, I'm mm -hmm. um that that cleansing, that um forgiveness, it is available to you today, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And not but and there is real consequences to our actions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the promise of scripture, and I think this is super important, it's not that we no longer are gonna magically like no longer deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. It's actually something more important. It's that the presence of Jesus will be with us as we walk through those consequences, as we walk through those realities, as we deal with those pains and with those hardships. And so, again, it's, it's consistently goes back to in Christ with us um, in the midst of it. And so if you're listening to this and you're like, man, I've I've held on to this thing and um, I've done something or I've hurt somebody and that really, you know, and you're just suffering with the weight of that on your heart. I just want to point you to the cross. Remember that when Jesus on the cross, I mean, there was a reason why physical, the, the physical reality of that day matched the spiritual reality. The world turned dark. Why? Because Jesus bore the sin of past, present, and future. I mean, this is a powerful imagery to the reality of what's happening spiritually that Jesus deals with, which means that he has handled and he has taken care of um, the the supernatural eternal consequence of that action. And he's going to walk with you faithfully as a friend, um, as as an older brother, um, as you walk through, you know, what the consequences of those things might be on this side of eternity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think too, like there, there is the things that we do that we do deserve consequences for. But then a lot of times 
this whole idea of, well, I didn't do anything, but I'm still walking through this. Yeah, especially like, this when it's hard. Like the book of Job, stuff. the whole book of oh, Job. Yeah, yeah. Where we read that and we're like, he didn't do anything yet. Look at <laughs> or even look worse, at what his happened. friends are saying. What yeah. did you do? Yeah. This, well, this his right. his friends are knuckleheads. Let's just <laughs> let's just go there. And then and not That's but a theological and, term I yeah, can get behind. And yes. <laughs> like let's all remember we are those friends. Yeah. <laughs> so the minute that we laugh, like yeah, they are we're like, oh yeah. And that's us too. Mm -hmm. You know? And I just I'd like to bring a little bit of humor but also some empathy to the friends because mm -hmm. they're just trying to make sense of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're living within a framework that they can only understand. Mm -hmm. Right? And so they're just like, dude, I think there's it started in a place of like just mm -hmm. even if you have to make up a sin, make it up. You know, like this is wild. You need to get out of this situation. Um, and yet I think what is so powerful about the story of Job and we know what's happening in the opening scenes that Job and he's just so insane. Job never finds out. God's never at some point that we're told in the narrative that he's like, hey, by the way, I had this wild conversation with the advers adversary in the divine council in the early pages of this of this book. You didn't know about it. Yeah. But just to let you know, like, dude, you're totally innocent, bro. In fact, I picked the fight. I put you on yeah. the stage, the 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 supernatural stage of uh, good and evil. Um, and hey, good news, you got an you got an A minus. You know, like mm -hmm. like he gets the minus because he does get emo like right. humanly emotional, but he never rejects God. But mm -hmm. Job never gets that. He never gets that in his humanity. What he gets consistently throughout the Book of Job is this willful intentionality of God to be like, hey, you keep asking why, I'm gonna show you who. Wow. Mm. You keep asking why. That's so good. I I'm going to show you the who behind the why. Yeah. And I think this is really important because we want more. You know, there's a phrase, the more money, the more problems. Mm -hmm. You know, you heard, you've heard of that before. Yes, I've heard it. Yeah, yeah. It's actually it. phrased, mo money, mo problems. Yeah, the more money, the more problems. <laughs> right. Um, I think the more knowledge, the more questions. The more knowledge, the yeah. more questions. And we want more knowledge. We're desperate for more knowledge. It's unbelievable. In my PhD progress, like process, I thought like at the end of it, I'm like, there's nothing more to learn. Heck no. I've got endless, I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh, every new book, there's more questions that come up. Yeah. I actually think God is protecting Job in this. He's protecting him of like, mm -hmm. you can ask, I can give you all the answers to all your questions. It's just going to open up a whole litany of more questions. Mm -hmm. What you need is not necessarily the answer to the questions, but to the who, who authors all those questions. Yeah. So we try to make things that happen into an equation because we're really just trying to answer the question of why yeah like, that's kind of what it boils down to isn't it yep yeah yeah but at the end of the day like i look at what i've been through or what you've been through in your life and you like if i actually got an answer to my question would that really help me probably not probably not yeah um, yeah so this idea of retributional theology is really us just trying to make sense of what god is doing when we know that we could Never do it. Yeah, it's it's a helpful. It's like the friends, the Job's friends. It's a it's a framework to help us make sense of a in like a senseless world, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and again, just like how God does with Job, but we need like it's not that it's wrong to ask the questions, but we have mm -hmm. to temper the asking of the questions with at some point our finite minds cannot comprehend, and we need humility to be able to to accept that reality. And when we hit that, mm -hmm. to turn to a loving God. Who's going to continuously continuously show us more of who he is yeah. in those moments where we don't have answers yeah so good wow well if you are listening to this mm -hmm. and you're like okay i need to remember all these theological terms that joel used yes. and i really kind of want to process this more we've created a free resource for you and what's so great about this resource is there's going to be questions to kind of help you mm -hmm. process how this might take shape in your life Mm -hmm. um it'll be in the show notes so go ahead and check it out yeah thank for you free. joel for helping put us that together this yes was fun. it yeah. was fun but i also just want to end on this like we talk about these types of topics retributional theology not because we know everything about everything here at proverbs like we just want to give you something to consider and give you a lot to think about and also admit we're right here with you <laughs> in learning what this is and we're right here with you guys and all having fought through our own battles and are still working through a lot of the questions that we have or fighting that mindset of thinking this is a equation or some answer that I deserve because of something that I did. And I think it's like a daily laying down of 
all the things that my human mind is trying to make sense of and remembering, like you said, Joel, the who. Yeah. Like we focus on who God is before we try to look for our answers. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. And that's all for today. Appreciate it.